Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the seventh of the HMI Data, AI and Society seminars. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet um, and paying my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so this is the first of our seminars, um, which we, conce we conceived the seminar as being um, sort of time zone agnostic. We wanted to be able to bring people in from all around the world. Um, and so this is the first where we've made that actual and we've, uh, we've shifted to the afternoon. Um, to enable us to speak with Seda Gerses in, in Europe. Um, so Seda is um, at TU Delft. Uh, she's an associate professor in the Department of Multi-Actor Systems um, in the Faculty of Technology Policy and Management, as well as having many other affiliations. Um, she's a very prominent figure in the, um, in the field of the privacy, um, engineering privacy, and also fairness, accountability, and transparency um, in machine learning and AI. Um, so Seda, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you for getting up early for us. Um, and uh, please do take it away. Lovely, thank you so much. Um, and first of all, thank you for having me here, uh, especially to Seth and Shell, who did a lot of organizing and making sure that the Zoom connection works. Um, and it is early in the morning, so we're gonna see how quickly my tongue loosens here. I have some coffee on my side, so we'll see how that goes. Um, usually they've, I've heard that the presentations are not interactive, but I will bomb you with a lot of information. So if you feel that something goes too fast, I would say um, if one of those who can intervene uh, want to say, could you please explain that again? I'm happy to go back and explain things. The title of my talk is Protective Optimization Technologies, a proposal for contestation in the world rather than fairness in the algorithm. So it's a it's a, it's a look at what has been propo proposed by computer scientists with respect to fairness and its focus on algorithms and let's say even data uh, and to propose an alternative given the limitations of that approach. So, oh, here we go. So I'm going to start with a quote from Michael Jackson, uh, the requirements engineer. I've been trained as a requirements engineer. It's uh, by now an almost obsolete science. And Michael Jackson is one of the gurus of requirements engineering. He, um, or let's go back. Requirements engineers are trying to think about ways to identify what systems are supposed to do. So who do you talk with? How do you get natural language requirements as they call them? And how do you specify them so that you can get a machine that fulfills the requirements in the world? And in fact, Michael Jackson is very, very concerned that computer scientists and engineers often focus on making a beautiful machine, but not looking at its consequences in the world. So quote, he says, computer scientists and engineers are concerned both with the world in which the machine serves a useful purpose and with the machine itself. The purpose of the machine is located in the world in which the machine is to be installed and used. So if we go back to um, what happens, for example, in all the fairness frameworks, which have been proposed as a, let's say, technical response to bias and algorithmic discrimination issues, we already see that the focus is very much on the machine. If we look at for example, the slide deck from Aaron Roth was, was one of the figureheads. He's not the only one, and he's a school of thought and fairness, but just bear with me. Um, you see, when he asked the question, where is unfairness or where is fairness, he quickly points out input, output, and the algorithmic process that is of interest to the scholars in this field. So what fairness frameworks and the scholars pursuing it do is they propose mechanisms to achieve some sort of equality, depending on the definition of the equality with respect to some sort of machine learning setup in the outcomes for either groups or individuals. I will not go into further detail of fairness frameworks. It's not necessary for the talk. I just want you to remember that what they're trying to do is look at the inputs, outputs of an algorithm and maybe the process of the algorithm to achieve some sort of parity or some definition of parity um, to asp and aspiring for what could be called fairness by design. Those of you who know privacy by design, it's this idea that already in the design of a system, you try to achieve certain properties or certain guarantees. And fairness by design does the same. It proposes a way for service providers, so those who are deploying machine learning, to mitigate discrimination harms um, at their discretion. So what's really important here uh, for me is to zoom out of the algorithmic and data view that is very prominent not only in computer science, but also in social sciences and media studies, which look at uh, information technologies, to look at the production of systems and see what that reveals about what is left out of these frameworks. And then I will come back to what it le leaves out about the world, um, the world in Michael Jackson's definition. 
So how do algorithms come to the world? Um, I'm not going to go into the history, although it's really, really fun. But something fundamental has changed ever since these gentlemen, who are the upper echelons of Microsoft, um, had parties to release their software. The most important part that to remember is that in the past, if you're old enough, uh, you bought diskettes or CDs or DVDs, depending on how old you are, um, to install software on your device. What that meant was the developers in the company producing that software had to have a sharp cut. They had to release the software in order to ship it and where shipping was not just a digital activity, it was putting it into trucks and putting it through the logistics and getting it to the shops where the customers would buy a shrink wrapped um, box, which would, they would then install on their devices. What has happened since the 90s with the rise of the web is what we call services. And what services do is somewhat different in that most of the code remains on the servers of the software company, so under the control of the developers. And what we do as consumers is, or users <laughs> is to connect to these servers to get the functionality. So our devices are no longer our personal computers, which hold all of our software and data, but in fact, our devices, they're sort of portals to these servers on the machines of the companies, which we then access. So what is the impact of this that is relevant to the rest of the talk? is that the code remains on the side of the developers. That means that they can continuously uh, observe how users are interacting with their software. So they can watch every click and every keystroke and use that feedback, flow, feedback that comes from the use into producing the software by optimizing their features. And at the same time, this also means that they can continuously introduce new features or remove old ones, optimizing the production to make sure that they can get the kind of experience that they want out of the software they're producing. There's a lot more to this and to give you an intuition of what has changed, it's like the shift from Microsoft Word to Office 365 or Google Docs, where if you installed Microsoft Word 20 years ago on your device, no data would go to uh, Microsoft and you would be using your, uh, your files on your computer and you'd be managing them yourself, which means that if your computer broke down, you lost all of your files. Whereas now with Office 365 or Google Docs, all of your documents are online on Google or Microsoft servers, and all of your clicks and keystrokes can be used to continuously optimize the software um, to increase, on the one hand, user experience, and on the other hand, um, to optimize the software for the extraction of value. There's a lot more tracking and tracing going on, but what you need to remember for now is that we have moved from shrink wrap software to services and the feedback loops in the services environment has allowed companies to optimize both observations of and design of the system in order to change the user behavior by continuously updating the features um, and to optimize the production of software with the plug and play of services which I'm not going to go into today. So what I argue in past work is to say that with optimization systems, um, sorry, with with all of these systems uh, and the optimization mechanisms that are now possible, we have almost made a hard move from information and communication technologies that we, as we've used to call them to something absolutely new. Uh, it's in continuum, but somewhat new maybe um, of optimization systems. So these are systems built using mathematical and managerial forms of optimization. They use a sort of, at least some projection of cybernetics of using feedback from users um, for operational environments. All feedback is metricized under the authority of objective functions, that is the optimization in mathematical forms, and that's where we see a lot of machine learning and AI. And what also happens is that the production and consumption of software is collapsed, right? Whereas in Microsoft, um, in the 90s, you would have the production of the software, you put it in the box, and then you would have the consumption of the software. We now have services in which you produce the software, and then you put it out in the world, and then you keep on refining and optimizing the software as people use it. So these are the fundamental differences. Of course, there are many others, which means that we now can create a different kind of system, which not only provides certain kind of automation or augmentation of workflows, but they can capture and manipulate both behavior and environments for the extraction of value. Because you can continuously check if updates and changes to your design either change the behavior that you, or move the behavior to what you want to see. You don't really care how people behave. You, you have a sort of statistical or a KPI approach to the kind of behavior you want the machine to deliver. Um, and you 
check continuous just to see how you can design the system to get to that behavior. And that KPI is usually associated with extraction of value. So if we take a very broad view, uh, a lot of the systems we use today are optimization systems. And we have in, in, in the scientific field, but also in the policy field, um, and more generally, spoken a lot about some of the negative pot potential outcomes of um, optimization systems. One of the things we've seen happen is asymmetrical concentration of powers in the hands of a few companies. And that is kind of relevant to what I'm going to say about fairness later too. Um, social sorting, as Oscar Gandhi has defined it, which we now call algorithmic discrimination and, um, and respond to it with fairness measures, uh, which I think is, does not do justice to the more complex topic that uh, Oscar Gandhi uh, went into. Uh, but we also see things like mass manipulations, as the case of Cambridge Analytica, a dominance of majority values and systems, and the erasure of minority needs that all kind of come with optimization as the math method of producing systems. So how does this connect to what I want to say about fairness? Um, and what I want to do now is to give you an example of an optimization system, which basically shows us what happens if we move out of the inputs and outputs of algorithms as the main concern of injustice and in building systems, but look at the systems in the world. Okay, so I'm continuously reiterating what Mike, Michael Jackson did um, in order to get us out of the limitations of the algorithmic view. So I'm going to give an example from um, location services. So location services is um, any sort of application that you might have experienced already, uh, which uses some sort of location um, mechanism to provide you services. Yeah. Uh, so Google Maps, I'm sure you've, many of you have used. Um, I checked last night, Waze was not very well known uh, until a couple of years ago, but I, if I hear correctly, it's now more popular, uh, but you can also think of things like Pokemon Go, and they make much more clear um, what I said about the definition of optimization systems, which is that they capture and manipulate behavior and environments. So here um, you can see how Pokemon Go has shown the power of um, using the devices in our pockets to nudge us, or nudge is not the right word, but at least to give us the right kind of signals to create ideal geographies from which they can then extract value, right? Here's a, a Pokemon Go players taking over a street, um, and you can see that this power is possible because of the way in which the system has been optimized to bring users together. Okay, but I'm not gonna talk about Pokemon Go. As I mentioned earlier, I'm going to talk about Waze. Waze is a uh, participatory um, traffic beating app, uh, participatory in that the users can um, input that there are roadblocks or police controls and, and further things. And at the same time, what it does is it gives you recommendations on routes, especially if there's a traffic jam. So if you're on the freeway, it would say, okay, get off the next ramp and go on the surface streets and then you can reduce your time to travel. So it's on the one hand, a, a software that's produced using methods of optimization, but it also takes the logic of optimization to its users saying here you can optimize your time to travel. So I want to see what are the kind of systematic issues um, or injustices or problems that arise as a result of optimization um, being put into the world as in the case of Waze. So traffic engineers have looked at the impact of Waze um, on the world and what they have found is that it actually promotes a certain kind of social behavior that increases contagion overall. It turns out that if a lot of people go on side streets, which are much easier to congest and much harder to decongest, that they not only create more traffic on the surface streets, but they also congest the freeway further, increasing congestion. So we already see that this app, which proposes to reduce travel time for individual users, actually causes collective costs and, environment, and has environmental outcomes that are negative. It doesn't stop there. You might have heard this also in Australia. Um, a lot of the surface streets are not ready for this kind of traffic. This is a picture from Los Angeles um, where fire trucks and limousine, limousines have gotten stuck on a street that is really not ready for this kind of traffic. Uh, and so what we see systematically is that ways um, in the process of extracting value by expanding its user base disregards the impact of their system on non-users and their environments. And 
traffic engineers say, you know, it's not unusual that people know surface streets and take them. There's always, you know, the 10 or 20 locals that know the surface streets and they will benefit uh, from knowing that if there's a traffic jam on the freeway. Uh, but it turns out ways kind of normalizes or um, makes a situation where it can, um, if a few ways users use it, then they can really benefit on their travel time. But if a lot of them use it, then those few might still benefit, but the rest actually suffer because of the increased contagion. So what I'm trying to do is try to show you that the way in which the mathematical and managerial forms of optimization function is that they externalize a bunch of costs onto other parties, and that's part of the way in which they extract value. And optimization itself actually is very significant, plays a significant role in these costs. So, what we've been doing with my colleagues um, is to see if we can actually identify common externalities that can be associated with optimization systems. I showed you in some of the examples of ways that they disregard non-users and their environmental impact. They benefit a few. Um, and if they're trained on the right, wrong environment, and then if they're, if they're used somewhere else, uh, then they can all of a sudden create errors, which you know, could also be externalized to, other, to the users or the environment. Um, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not gonna go through this whole list, but the point I wanna make is that by already taking a systems view, you see a lot more problems that impact society and, and communities that might be hardly affected by, by you know, much hardly hit by such systems, um, which are all left out of frame, fairness frameworks, right? If we look at this list, um, the benefiting a few, one could argue fairness framework somehow addresses maybe um, distributional shifts, so if the, the data set is trained in, in one environment, but then applied in an envir another environment, fairness could potentially address those things. Um, distribution of errors that was uh, very much used in the Compass case, you know, what happens with your false po positives and false negatives, and can we get parity in the outcomes? Those are the kind of things that fairness looks at, but it leaves out all these other things that can happen um, systematically when you apply optimization systems in the world. So, Okay, I'm trying to get at something, but I want to see if I can maybe formalize it some more. Um, and I'm going to go back to Michael Jackson. So is there a way uh, for me to tell you and convince you that there's a delta between fairness frameworks, which, which focus on algorithms and data, and fairness in the world? Okay, so to do that, I said I would use Michael Jackson. This is what he looks like, unlike what most people expect. Um, and so what Michael Jackson tries to do uh, for computer scientists is to provide an ontology uh, of the world, uh, which is you know, very problematic for many different reasons, but just bear with me um, to say what kind of system, what kind of machine, so uh, the whole thing is called for him a system, the environment plus the machine, what kind of machine do we introduce in the world so that we can get to certain outcomes in the environment? So he says the job of a requirements engineer, remember that one is kind of obsolete, um, is to find those requirements or the changes you want in the environment and to specify the machine that will fulfill those in the world. So he gives a little bit more detail to the ontology. He says the environment has something called domain assumptions. So these are the things, these are the, this is, these are the facts in the world, he calls them, that describe the behavior of the environment as it is. So what happens in the world? And then the requirements are statements about the desired conditions in an environment. So let's say you want to improve traffic time, uh, travel time for, for users, etc. cetera. Um, so it, it, the requirements describe the application domain and the problems to be solved. And he's very much into problem definition and what, how to solve these uh, problems. He has proposed something else called problem frames, which I will not go into today. Then he says, um, there's a specification and specification is about the phenomena that's shared and phenomena you need to keep in mind between the machine and the environment. It's a restricted form of requirement providing enough information for the engineer to implement the system. So it tells the engineers what it is they need to build, but not necessarily how to build it. So if I say um, the engineers need to build a system that reduces travel time for users, um, that's a specification and then you can be more specific and say, okay, I you know, measure travel time as such and such and the system is successful if it you know, um, reaches a certain threshold defined by the stakeholders of the system. But what is supposed to happen is that you go for requirements in the world to how the machine is going to achieve it, which is described in the specification. Programs, on the other hand, implement the specification. So 
The requirements engineer gives a specification, tells it what the system is supposed to do, and the program is how you're going to implement that. So how you're going to design the machine to do that. So if I come back to where I would locate fairness frameworks here, it is in the specification, I would say. Um, although, of course, you know, there's a part where it's engineered, but for a moment, I'm going to leave that out. And I would say what fairness frameworks do in terms of research is explore a specification of a machine that is fair. So let's call it as fair for some definition of fairness. Um, and for all inputs, the output and the outputs of the machine, they will be fair. Okay. So now I can in this ontology, express a little bit the kind of things that get left out by focusing only on the specification of the machine and not what its impact is in the world, which is what we're necessarily usually concerned with when we want fairness and social justice, for example. So let's give an a, example. So let's say that we have a fair predictive policing algorithm that can fairly distribute police officers to different neighborhoods. So we're done. We've got parity. Everybody gets equal amounts of police officers. Um, for some definition of equal. So now let's look at the domain assumption that maybe the policing institution is already configured to control minorities uh, and interactions with police pose greater risk of harms to those minorities, in which case actually fairness in the world is not achieved. What we have is a fair allocation of resources, but they can nevertheless disparately impact those minorities. So, if we have a fair specification, it might also not capture the effect of machine on phenomena not shared with the machine. Remember I said there's phenomena that's shared in the specification and keep in mind the word phenomena. Uh, these could be behaviors or activities in the world that is not shared with the machine. So if we think about, for example, something as bare Airbnb, which actually has been shown to have lots of discrimination issues in their platform, but let's assume that they have achieved fairness so that hosts and visitors alike are not discriminated for some notion of fairness. But we have dozens of reports that have shown that Airbnb has been disrupting neighborhoods by changing rent dynamics and neighborhood composition. So again, this is not going to um, be part of an algorithmic fairness because it's out in the environment and it's something that is neither of concern nor part of the solutions of fairness frameworks. Specification that is fair may also not capture potential harms from phenomena in the machine. So <clears throat> here I'm going to give a Pokemon Go example. What Pokemon Go developers did was when they started their world in which people could play Pokemon Go, they needed a map where the Pokemons would be generated. To do that, they used Ingress, which was uh, the, a map that was generated by Ingress players, which was a short-lived game, which was mainly picked up by early adopters, which happened to be mostly white men. So when Pokemon Go started off, in a lot of um, poor, and, and this was in the US, um, poor and especially black neighborhoods, there were practically no Pokemons to be found. Um, so here we see again where you know, Pokemon Go can say, I am fair to all of my users, and those users might even include um, communities that are usually underrepresented in these systems, but the map, which is in the implementation of the machine, might cause a harm in the world that is very difficult to capture with uh, the specification that is fair. Okay. I refer you to our paper to look at other types of let's say delta between what it means to achieve fairness or social justice in the world from a systems view versus achieving fairness in a specification, um, mostly because of time concerns. Um, I don't want to also eat your, totally geek out on here it, it works and here it doesn't. Um, but there's something else that I want to emphasize, uh, which is that even Michael Jackson has his shortcomings, uh, even though he's a, he's a bit of a mentor for me. Um, which is that he skips on the political economy. And this is something that also fairness frameworks do not look at. Remember I said in the very beginning um, that, that fairness frameworks assume that fairness will be applied at the discretion of the service provider. But if you study the political economy of these services and the kind of power imbalances they're, built, they're currently um, engaged in or that are part of, um, you will see that they might not always have the incentive to capture fairness requirements in their environment. They might not have the incentive to take care of their externalities. Uh, for example, 
in the case of Waze, people from neighborhoods have called Waze saying, you know, you're destroying our street. Uh, municipalities have called Waze to say you're increasing congestion in our city. And Waze has said this is too costly. We cannot respond to you or just completely ignore them. Um, and so we see that the economic incentives are not aligned for these companies to take into consideration fairness in the world. And in a sense, fairness in the algorithm is a convenient solution for them to say, we're done. And in fact, you can imagine that companies have an incentive to not only optimize their systems for fairness, but to optimize fairness, to say, to, to take the minimum threshold for fairness, whatever that may be, and to say, look, I'm done, right? And so this is the part where Michael Jackson also misses because he assumes that computer scientists and engineers want to do good in the world. Um, and here we see that actually economic and political in incentives might lead these companies otherwise. And the fact that fairness frameworks are at their discretion um, might actually um, end up impacting how much fairness even the specification provides. Okay. Um, if you look at the paper, you will see where we make some assumptions. Um, these are somewhat more formalistic uh, approaches to show what happens when you focus only on the algorithm's inputs and outputs and not on what's happening in the world. Um, and we even leave out the incentives problem to show that it's very costly and difficult for fairness frameworks to address some of these concerns that we talked about. So if I would want to kind of elicit a conclusion from what I have told you, what, here's what I have to say about fairness frameworks. First of all, um, they focus on a narrow definition of harms in the inputs and outputs of an algorithm in a somewhat decontextualized manner. They do not look at what happens in the environment. There are some people who have started doing that and there are always ca cautionary tales, but it is a very, very computer science-y project in that, um, in that it um, tries to decontextualize a solution that can be applied across contexts, right? Fairness frameworks mitigate discrimination harms at the discretion of a service provider that has potentially incentives to optimize otherwise. In fact, studies have shown that they often have other, other incentive structures than being fair. Um, whereas, in fact, service providers often exist in an interlocked web of systems that introduce or amplify existence, existing injustices, as a lot of recent work has shown, um, anywhere from Ruha Benjamin uh, to Safia Nobles and many others who show that there are these interlocked web of systems that in, in the technology domain that um, amplify existing injustice, if not introduce new ones. What is of greater concern to me is the fact that fairness frameworks narrow down politics and the possibility of contestation to the redesign of the algorithm, which may not be the site of the problem, which I hope I, hope I showed you, and may not be the site of the solution. Um, in addition to that, as a privacy person, I would say that fairness frameworks do not say much about privacy. Uh, they very much are uh, on that debate of collection versus use on how you use the data, not so much whether you, you collect too much data or not. In fact, a good number of fairness frameworks says you should maybe, in addition to your usual data set, um, collect um, sensitive attributes to check if there's unfairness in your system. So as, as, as frameworks, they kind of confirm the use of data often from that dodgy data markets without questioning computational power. So we have, made, we have a little response to, uh, as an alternative to fairness frameworks. Remember we talked about ways. Um, and so we thought about what is it that, what is a kind of solution that would not put all the power in the hands of the service provider? What is something that could give maybe more power to individuals or communities or environments that are impacted by optimization systems? And that's how we came out, up with protective optimization technologies. And I think it would be more right to say, this is how people came up with protective optimization techniques. And we wrote a paper to show that this is possible, maybe necessary and, and appeal to computer scientists um, to develop such, solu so, such solutions. So um, the solution we found from residents is that um, they would often turn on ways on their surface street roads and report roadblocks. Remember, it's a participatory uh, application. So they would say there's a roadblock on my street, which would then give feedback to the optimization algorithm that this road is blocked and the traffic would be rerouted to other parts of the city. And in fact, we saw a lot of different examples of people basically um, interacting with the system and changing inputs to the system in different ways so that they can get better outcomes for their environment. Um, so we talked about the virtual roadblock. Uh, I heard in Australia, the police do not want people to use ways. 
um, because people can now spot police checks. Um, so in Miami, what they did is they put police checks everywhere, so it would be unreasonable to trust one over the other. Um, and some researchers uh, created a bunch of ghost accounts to create, make it look like there's a traffic jam on the freeway, which meant all the, all the cars that are using ways would be diverted to surface streets and they had the freeway for themselves. So we see that users already, and some of the more competent and, um, or more knowledgeable about technology than others, have found ways to push back on the, on the externalities of optimization systems. So what we do uh, in our framework or proposal is to say, okay, these are ad hoc responses, um, you know, ways, for example, quickly found a way to identify those residents who are not really using ways, but using it to counter it um, and blocking their accounts. So how can we increase the effectiveness of these efforts and systematize them so that they're more effective for those who are impacted by optimization systems negatively? Um, so we propose that computer scientists should engage with this. They should design tools um, that allow users to re-optimize their world for themselves. Um, and we do this using, uh, um, for example, adversarial machine learning. Uh, we switch um, the trust model of adversarial machine learning, which is that usually um, computer scientists assume that the machine learning service provider is good and the adversary is somebody else who's outside who's trying to game the machine learning system. And we actually turn it around and say, what if the machine learning service provider is causing harm to the environment? How can we use the fact that machine learning is so malleable or let's say vulnerable to um, these inputs from the outside, which can change its outcomes um, to the benefit of the people who are impacted by these systems. So to give you an example in the case of Waze, um, what we did is we used uh, traffic interdiction algorithms developed in World War II to keep the Russians from getting to the front stage too quickly uh, by bombing out the right roads. So you optimize which roads you, uh, you bomb out. Um, so it's a war technique, but Okay, it provided what we needed. Um, and so what it does is looks at exactly which roads, which parts of a surface road need to be either blocked or, or you can introduce, for example, speed limits or traffic lights or one-way streets um, so that the time to travel through the city is not worthy for people to get off the freeway. Um, and that way you somewhat increase a little bit the tr travel time for the residents of that city, but you make it unoptimal for ways to propose that street unless there's a very, very big traffic jam on the, on the freeway. And you can see that it's a collective solution in the sense that you, know, you can propose this to municipalities um, who do not get a response from these companies because they scale up and they serve thousands of cities. And so they can't care less about one city that's complaining um, to find a solution maybe uh, not a solution, but to raise the issue and to make clear and show forms of contestation that would otherwise not be possible. Okay, um, just to kind of give you a, a, a comparison before I finish, um, plots start from injustice from systems um, and affected populations and their environments rather than a top-down definition of what is fair or unfair um, executed by a centralized agent, the service provider. POTS aspire for just outcomes in the environment, so not in the algorithm. Parity may be part of such solutions, but may not be sufficient. POTS produce a different kind of politi political contestation, um, including the contestation of utilitarian models, which usually underline both um, machine learning and fairness um, for the management of everything. There are also problems with POTS, but I think we can come back to that during the discussion. I went a little over time. Thank you for your patience. That was fantastic. Thanks so much, Sita. Um, I've got about 15 questions here. Um, but uh, I'd like to invite people on the, um, on the panel to use, your, use the hand function to raise your hands. Um, and those of you who are in the audience, um, if you'd like to use the Q&A, um, and we'll go through them there. Um, I'm going to start with a question from Atuza. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, Seda. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, I think I wanted to a little bit uh, question you on this distinction between optimization systems versus uh, counter optimization systems, right? Because the general like optimization framework is very very broad, and so normally uh, we can we can consider some issues about the environment um, with respect to the objective function in the optimization or we can set some constraints of the optimization. Still, we are using an optimization kind of framework. Yes. So in some sense, then the, the criticism is not really about like whether we are using 
an optimization framework or a non-optimization framework, but it's like really about how we define these optimization functions, what are the decision variables, how we define the constraints and things like that. So, yeah, so then basically the idea is that the crit system is not about optimization systems. It's about the way we define them. Right. So um, I, I, I will not go back to the slide, but one, one of the things we do is we say POTS itself is a provocation um, to show that you can't solve optimizations problems with more optimization. Because you can imagine that when the Waze users on a street um, report a roadblock and the traffic is diverted from their street, it usually goes to another street, right? <laughs> and so now you've just removed the problem from your street, but maybe you've put it on somebody else's. And of course, you know, you can say, okay, well, I'm going to engineer the system so that it goes to that street, which is the least uh, going to cause disturbances to the neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. But the point that we try to make is that optimization as the only form of governance, right, does not address the complexity of the world. And, and, even the pots um, may surface the problems with an optimization system, but they do not necessarily solve it. And in fact, they show some of the ways in which optimization means almost per definition to externalize certain costs to others. Right. I don't know if that kind of helps a little bit. Can, yeah. can I do a quick? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, because uh, there are all these kinds of optimization, like local optimization, global optimization, sure. and there are some, some scientists, mathematicians like Euler, <laughs> who would make claims about like, at some point we can define everything in terms of optimization. That's so I right. think there yeah. to be like clear about what is excluded from the notion of right. optimization. Yeah. It's very interesting because, you know, when I gave this talk at the Simons Institute with a lot of people who do optimization, they said, well, everybody optimizes all the time, right? Like, and, and I had to remind them, you know, since the time of um, mechanical clocks, I think we have a tendency to use our technological advances as metaphors for human activity. Uh, so people used to think that we are all like clocks. Um, and, you, you know, about 20 years ago, physicists said everything is a network. And so we were all of a sudden networks, right? Um, and then somebody stood up at Simon's Institution and said, Institute and said, we're all computation, right? <laughs> so I think we need to be careful uh, with being too excited about our current techniques and applying them to everything and to say, you know, they do certain things. We live in, despite COVID-19, in a logistical world with limited resources in which optimization is a necessary technique. However, if you start using it as the only technique to manage very sensitive areas of life, including the basic infrastructure that we use, in a way that, lev that companies, and remember, we're not talking about public institutions that are held accountable to the public uh, through a bunch of democratic procedures. We're talking about companies that transcend national state borders and deliver these services and claim that they're optimizing when they're, they're optimizing their value extraction. So these are two, right? There's a technique on the one hand, and there's the companies who are scaling up globally on the other, which is a very different setup already. And then to say optimization is what we all do anyways, and these companies are do it, just doing it, and the more information they have, the, the better they will do it, really undoes both the kind of limitation that they bring on what optimization can do because of their value extraction interests, as well as the fact that they're not accountable to a democratic constituency by virtue of being global companies. And just a little sort of uh, note on that. I think that although the, in, in the ideal, you could say that all of these things are trying to solve optimization problems such that they, they could in principle be specified in, in that sort of way. And you know, in principle, these of these apps can solve collective action problems in a way that um, you know, we're not able to without this level of communication. Um, if in practice no company is ever going to actually take into account all of the relevant interests and actually going to optimize for all of the things that matter, um, then um, the, the fact that in principle you can express it in a certain way um, wouldn't end up having much, um, uh, much purchase. But I think that's what you were just saying anyway. So, mm -hmm. um, so uh, the next question is uh, going to be from Katie. Hi, thanks. Yeah, great talk. Thanks, Sita. Um, yeah, so while you were talking, I was reflecting on whether, like, you were suggesting that um, these online apps in, sort of encourage or erode our capacity for pro-social behavior. So, you know, for many years, we've sort of relied on people being willing to follow norms um, and 
and to uh, have some self-sacrifice at least if they're conditional on other people also following the norms and so on. And yeah, no, and so these apps that sort of get you, promise you optimal outcomes for yourself are really kind of taking away from that spirit that we, you know, we rely on. But there is something odd though in that people are sort of remarkably pro-social towards other users in the app. I mean, more than, uh, it baffles me, you know, I, I like rarely leave comments on appliances or, you know, all the ways in which you we're able to share information online. I mean, I rarely do it, but other people seem to be much more socially oriented. So there's sort of strange um, tension between sort of a lot of social behavior in these small groups, but, um, increasing isolation of that group to the outside world? Is that the kind of phenomenon that you're picking up on? I think, um, I think what I'm picking up on is two things, and I think maybe it relates to the first question to the second as well, which is that these companies are in a sense creating environments in which we act, where they determine what are the conditions of our acting. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, even if we find that this is, um, socially pleasant for a while, right? Um, first of all, the utilitarian logic means that minorities are typically are going to be erased, right? And this is, for example, if you look at what happened with Facebook with minority users, right? Like they're usually subject to a lot more harassment. Um, you know, the, the policies impact them uh, much further, anything from freedom of expression to real name policies, like it affects LGBTQ uh, communities and sex workers much more um, if you're, um, a person of color or a black person, uh, you know, you're much more likely to be subject to harassment that the company will not pick up on, especially if you're a minority, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then there's, of course, a geopolitical level where, you know, uh, the Cambridge Analytical thing will make headlines across the globe, but the, uh, the fact that in Myanmar, NGOs raise red flags with respect to the use of Facebook in the genocide, um, we still haven't had any sort of accountability around that, right? And mm -hmm. so, what I'm trying to say is that these companies are creating environments in which they, they manage populations and environments in, under the logic of optimization, which limits political contestation. Even if it looks good now, it might not be looking good for a minority that is not worthy under a utilitarian logic, right? I mean, it's worthy from a universal um, values, right? Like everybody has rights, kind of human rights or ethics perspective. But the utilitarian perspective will say, you know, if I have a billion users there's a, and there's a million that's struggling, oh well, <laughs> right? Like th that's the utilitarian logic. And it's very hard to break out of it. And it's exactly that kind of removal of contestation and, and what fairness does is it says any justice claims can be dealt with by the service provider, which is very problematic, right? It, it's anti-democratic by design, if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. No, there's a lot to think about. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so the next question is going to come from Damien. Hello. <laughs> thanks Hi, Damien. Um, I suppose, like... My question kind of follows on from that because I suppose to a certain extent, you know, it's not the responsibilities of the businesses themselves to be democratic. It's the responsibility of policymakers and the legislature. So like, right. I mean, your solution, obviously, I mean, you kind of indicated to the, towards the end that some of these solutions could be, you know, given to municipalities in order to sort their problems. Uh, but don't, isn't there already just a simple way of saying, well, that business model is actually causing too much collective harm, we should just simply not allow it. Um, and I'm wondering to what extent, like, you know, the traditional fairness debates in the, like, the fair machine learning literature are actually kind of, I mean, they're the consequence to a certain degree of process orientated requirements kind of that are actually required in law as it is. So the requirement, like accountability mechanisms and impact assessment, and then they kind of they have to do that, so they've operationalized it to a certain extent. Whereas actually, kind of what you're discussing are kind of broader debates and actually a failure of society to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And then you're optimi optimizing, <laughs> sorry, but probably a bad use of the word, to actually you know, come with technical solutions for what is actually a social problem and should probably be done more directly through, I don't know, law or whatever, or policy, or however you construe it. Mm -hmm. 
I, let me see if I can answer this in a, <laughs> in a short way. And it's very nice to see you. Um, <laughs> so we, we've come up with, we've kind of been looking at where these companies are going with respect to investment. And what we see is there's been, you know, ever since 2008, a lot of money has gone into tech companies. Actually, you see this now with COVID-19 as well as markets kind of struggle. A lot of money goes into tech because it's much more uh, stable in comparison. And actually, they're making a lot of money out of the suffering of COVID-19. So that's kind of interesting to think about as well. So where these companies have to go in order to return on investment is to integrate computation as much as possible into existing infrastructures. And by existing infrastructure, I mean transportation, health, education, everything that we see with COVID-19 that's propelled forward was already a project of these companies. And we call this programmable infrastructures. So what these companies propose is a way to make more optimized or maybe even augment existing infrastructures by integrating digital into it. And in a sense, it's comparable to the advertisement model, right? Like Google made a lot of money by taking everybody's um, advertisement budget. Uh, what these companies' clouds are going to make money of is by taking everybody's IT budget. And the biggest IT, the IT budgets or the greatest potential is when they can take whole infrastructures. That includes the universities and the fact that we're using Zoom right now as part of that project, right? Um, so if you look at it this way, municipalities and democratic institutions are up against companies with global finance that are, that, whose project is to take over the management of the infrastructures that those democratic institutions are actually put to the public. And this is exactly the kind of tension that we're looking at. And indeed, you could argue um, that, the, that the, you know, the algorithms is you know, in the design and you can still ask these questions and that these companies are taking over existing infrastructures is a different level of a problem, right? But let's take a moment, take a step back and say, if it's the case that these systems are eroding democratic institutions that manage our infrastructures and they're optimizing for their optimal users, and they can escape regulatory mechanisms, or if they don't, they become the implementers of regulation, again, becoming even stronger, right? Then what does it mean that they have a fairness claim? Does that make sense? Does that answer kind of your question? To some extent? <laughs> I mean, let, let, let's put it this way, right? Like with COVID-19, we had the split of those who could stay home, uh, many of us I think could, and work from home using these digital services. And there were a bunch of those who had to go out and deliver care and delivering also packages, right? Like people who kept the logistics going and kept things going. Both of those are managed by technology. Now you can say the, the delivery services are fair, but if you look at the workers that are there, they're mostly um, lower class, if that term still holds, and they're mostly people of color. How are you going to have a fairness framework there that is going to respond to the fact that technology companies have enabled the situation in which some people are continuously at, at risk while others are safe. Um, so the next question from Colin. Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, I'm sympathetic to a lot of this, but I worry that a lot of the framework was kind of evil tech companies versus noble municipalities and noble users. And of course, I can see a lot of this going the wrong way, right? So the kind of user hacking of ways, presumably, at least initially, is going to push uh, cars off of tech bro surface streets and into poor neighborhoods. And even in terms of privatization, I mean, so New South Wales is always on a big privatization kick and takes it as one of the features that you can push over all this responsibility to companies and then you can't use, do freedom of information requests and so on. So, I mean, it's not obvious to me that, you know, any of these, like I can see how they can be used for good in some cases, but I can also see how they can very easily just, a lot of the stuff you're proposing very easily just exacerbate existing inequalities. Mm -hmm. And if you're kind of cynical about the world, which I'm, tend to be these days, you might think that that's probably going to be the modal sort of thing, right? Is that uh, if the system is set up to say, screw over minorities, then, you know, it's going to find a way to do that kind of, it's sort of tech agnostic about which way it does it. So. Absolutely agreed. And I don't want to romanticize municipalities at all, right? Like, and I've actually heard people saying, you know, the state was not managing us before, at least these companies are doing us a favor, right? Um, but I think my point is not to say, uh, let's embrace our institutions with all their ups and downs, uh, but 
or, you know, and look away from their downs, let's say, you know, the university has some problems too, for example. <laughs> but I think, uh, you know, um, the point is, and I think this is, you know, a lot of people get a little worried when I give talks because they feel like there's no way out, like these companies have already won. And I sometimes lose sleep because I do think that's somewhat true. But I also think that if we could understand that the contestation is much more than redesigning algorithms, that we could actually rethink what, what our institutions look like that can live together with this technology. But right now, what we see, and I have to say, um, I've been part of um, COVID-19 uh, contact tracing app development, and I've seen both health authorities and governments neither understand the infrastructural power they're dealing with, nor have the capacity to manage existing public resources to benefit the people. In fact, they just, push their populations onto these companies. And I think they're, you know, without romanticizing public institutions, there could be a way to look for how we engage with these companies and how we introduce them to our existing infrastructures. That is currently not even spoken about, mostly because both academics and policymakers are stuck on algorithms. I think we're going to have to have a lot, get a, a lot of ongoing discussions in the Slack. I, I'm sort of shutting myself up from having a follow-up on this clear point. Um, I'm going to keep being disciplined and pass on to Sarita. There's also one in the Q&A as well um, oh, that just popped in. Um, but I'll take advantage of this to uh, ask my question. So I want to bring it back around to Achusa's question because it's something that comes up a lot and I really like where you're going with your answer. So I want to think, uh, like, I just want to try out how I understood it and, and I see if that, like, makes sense to you. So what I understand you saying essentially is that, like, optim what optimization does is it, um, like, you have to pick a domain in which you're optimizing and whatever that domain is, you're going to push the costs outside of it. And there isn't, like, it's not feasible or even, like, sensible to talk about the domain being all considerations you would ever make about any, like, any possible systems that might interact with the system you're working in. Um, and so you're talking very fast. Can you? Stop? Sorry, <laughs> I'm looking at I you like. Oh. <laughs> I need to work on that. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, let's try again. I'll, I'll start over. Early okay. morning. Early morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So what you're saying to Atiza, what I what I heard you saying essentially is that when you are optimizing, you're you're starting with some domain in which you're optimizing, um, and some way of framing the problem, and. Um, what, however you've done it, however broadly you've defined the problem and the parameters, like the optimization will find a way to push the cost outside of that. And you are saying that furthermore, it's not reasonable or sensible to talk about having all of your considerations from the start in your, um, in your domain. Mm -hmm. And so you can think of, so, so basically the problem is that there's no such thing as a static defense against like uh, injustice in a system. And so you could think of, and so Atuza would then reply that you can think of it maybe as like a dy dynamical optimization. You notice right. the problem, you expand the domain in response to that. Right. Right. Um, and I guess the, and then the response to that is just that it's like, like maybe we're not even close technologically to being where we're at the right level of abstraction to still have mm -hmm. optimization be a useful framework for talking about that. Okay, let, let's try. Okay, like I, it's a very kind of what I said, but like let's try to be um, a bit closer to the model that we proposed. Okay, so um, the proposal was that we could improve optimization by, you know, either picking not so asocial um, goals, right? Like that's the AI yeah. for good project, remember? Like AI mm -hmm. can be for bad, but we're going to make it for good, right? Um, and we can continuously extend the model. We can make it multi-objective optimization. There are all these ways in which we can put constraints, right? All these ways mm -hmm. you can improve the optimization. Let's give an example of errors, which is what fairness is concerned with, like how are the mm -hmm. errors distributed? There is no optimization system that's not going to make errors. Yeah, there's no machine learning mm -hmm. system that's always going to deliver 100%. I mean, that's an interesting idea, but you know, it's mostly a fantasy um, that we can have. But in reality, the world is more complex and we can model it, and so there's going to be errors. What a centralization of the design of optimization makes is to decide what kind of error is acceptable and who's going to maybe even um, uh, have the burden of that error. And that is the power that you start creating. And if there's no way, alternative way to contest and say, look, we're, we're bearing the burden of these errors. And the company says, well, look at my utilitarian logic. This is the best outcome for society from a very utilitarian perspective. 
there is no, you see how we have basically undone political process by, Femnick McKelvey says it, right? Optimization becomes a way to remove political contestation or to trump any sort of political contestation. It's optimal, right? And so there is no optimization system without errors. Um, and what you do with introduction of optimization systems, and really I'm not talking about the technique, I'm talking about these computational infrastructures and the companies that are building up on them, you know, taking over different parts of the, of the world, either by taking over infrastructures or piggybacking onto public infrastructures that they don't feel responsible to, et cetera. They get this power to determine what is optimal on this infrastructure and who bears the burdens, who bears the costs, and, and where they make the cut. And none of these things are currently being discussed, right? Yeah? And yeah. so there's no optimization without an externality, even if it's a good optimization, if it's with the best of our heart, right? Like it has good goals. It took all of these things into account. Um, and we show mathematically that it would be very difficult to actually reach with optimization all the externalities in the environment. It would be too costly, right? Um, but the discussion ends there. Right, the companies decide where the cut is, and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Currently, I mean, I would want to think about alternative ways to this, but that's currently where it is. And you know, um, we can go into this other direction of can we build different kinds of systems? But there's a whole political economy of why it's cheaper to plug yourself into the cloud infrastructures and service architectures that I left out of this talk, uh, which is something else, right? Which makes it very difficult to change these systems on your own, right? The privacy community has tried that for years. We've tried to develop alternative infrastru infrastructures and we cannot compete with global finance backed infrastructures that are made cheap or they can burn through money for months. If you just look at how Snowflake got an IPO uh, this week with immense uh, earnings, right? Like you can look that up and you will see they burnt through millions before they got to that point. You know, no municipality can burn through millions like that to make a cheap infrastructure. Okay, so we're going to have one last question from the Q&A panel. Um, so the, the one that we don't get to, if you would like to copy that over to the Slack channel and we'll, we'll continue the discussion there. Um, but Salma Khan asks how users co consent and autonomy um, can be factored into this. So obviously when you're thinking about um, apps like Waze, you know, one reason why they have a particular constituency is that there is this particular set of users who consent to, be, um, uh, mm -hmm. who, who consent to have their data collected and to be shared with them. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, Samar asks um, how, given this um, consent, we should take into account fairness, um, whether there is, uh, I suppose I'll gloss on that, uh, whether there's a natural constituency given by the fact that um, there is user consent at the foundation um, of these apps. Presumably right. Samar would also add modulo all of the problems with uh, noticing consent in um, the context right. of the <laughs> yes. yes. In fact, you know, if you look um, at the very short writing we did on programmable infrastructures, um, we talk about pocket power um, as another way in which democratic institutions can be sidestepped. Uh, so I will give you a completely different example, and I apologize for this. But I mean, I guess Waze is, is itself an example, right? Like, or even Uber, right? Like some cities will say this is not allowed anymore, but how are you going to keep people from running the application, right? Uh, without putting out a very big surveillance system and, you know, um, finding people for having apps on their phones, which is ridiculous, right? Like, and so um, these companies are indeed um, very cognizant of the fact that um, they have what I call pocket power. They're already in the devices that are in our pockets and can already um, decide the functionality, et cetera. So with respect to consent, um, I just want to say that, you know, the reason I got into this research was not because I was interested in uh, fairness. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a very, uh, I'm very politi politically interested in social justice as a computer scientist, but fairness was never for me the way. Um, but I was working on privacy and I was thinking for years that there was something wrong with the way we expected users to decide on privacy when there had been already a cascade of decisions made to them. So they were left with like this little sliver, you can go between A and B, when all of these decisions about how data is gonna be collected about them, what's the defaults, et cetera, had been done. So what I started doing is studying developers and their ability to produce better privacy for the users. Like see if I could, you know, get privacy engineering in, et cetera, very like, Michael Jackson, right? Like we can do this right. Um, and it was at that moment when I understood 
that the way the, the software industry has moved from shrink wrap software to services and this continuous optimization, that most developers will not develop software from scratch. But they will plug and play with services that already exist. Right? Like, that's why when you go to a lot of websites and you have to log in, they'll ask if you want a Google or Facebook login and they won't have a separate login because it's costly to introduce your own login and to secure it, right? You need to hire someone to make sure your system is secure, et cetera. So what we have is an ecosystem where already the, the, the fundamental decisions are made at an infrastructure level upon which all of these developers build these apps. So the idea that we can produce autonomy or better consent is limited by whatever decisions have been made at the infrastructure level. So that puts a huge break on what we can expect from um, age, like the ability to give agency to users because even the developers don't have agency. And that's my concern with respect to fairness. What does it mean to solve fairness at the level of infrastructure when fairness is about multiple groups contesting, right? Like who has rights and how, and the groups continuously change, et cetera. What does it mean to have already resolve that issue at the level of infrastructure with hundreds of thousands of different groups. That, that's an impossibility. It's always good to finish on an impossibility. Um, so look, uh, I'm gonna go over right away to Slack and I'm gonna write about 15 questions. Um, anyone else, I encourage you to do the same. Thank you, Seda, for, for getting up so early for such a fascinating talk. Um, and let's all give you a sort of silent Zoom round of applause. Um, <laughs> and yeah, thank you very much. Um, we'll stop the broadcast in a moment. Um, Great. Thank you all for coming and joining the session.